and welcome to Talk Jazz with George Witte, hosted by ArtistWorks.com. I'm Joe McDonough, Marketing Manager at ArtistWorks, and thank you for joining us. George Witte is a Grammy and Emmy award-winning musical artist. He is a composer, pianist, music producer, master of recording technology, and his latest gig is online teacher of jazz piano at ArtistWorks. But the best, perhaps the best way to introduce George is to hear his music. So um, joining us now uh, from his home outside Los Angeles is George Witte. Uh, George, I just turned on your microphone. Can you hear us? I can hear you fine. Okay, great. And um, we can hear you. Well, uh, first of all, good morning and thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Uh, before we jump into our conversation, um, I'm sure all of us on, on the line would love to hear you play. And I understand that you prepared something to lead us in. Uh, what are we about to hear? Well, we're about to hear uh, a, an old tune, an old standard called Liza, which I believe is from uh, My Fair Lady, but I am not sure. And the reason that I love this tune is because it comes from a, a, one of my top five favorite piano CDs, which is the Chick Corea and Herbie Hancock duo record that they made back in the 70s. I think it was about 40 years ago. And uh, it's just a fun kind of a romp. It's on what we call rhythm changes. Uh, basically, the idea is uh, I got rhythm. And there's a million modifications of that. And then it has a bridge that's better. So I'm just going to kind of wind out on that a little bit. Fantastic.
what a way to lead us in. Uh, thank you, George, for that. That was amazing. You're welcome. Yeah. yeah, I've always had fun with that. And I'm telling my artist work students, you know, definitely buy that CD because, uh, you know, it's two masters. And the thing that I love about it is that they're just sitting there trying to crack each other up. And <laughs> here in the YouTube era, you know, right. I mean, I bought that thing and they, they actually put out two. Herbie's label put out one and Chick's label put out one. And uh, I like the Columbia one a little bit better. But on YouTube now, you can go back and watch actual, you know, footage, video footage of these guys doing this. And it's so different from night to night. That's the genius of it. Right. Um, and, you know, it's, I don't know. It's just so great to hear two of my very favorite musicians ever just sitting there having fun together. Yeah, it, 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 it really works great at 11 o'clock in the morning. And I know we have viewers from all over the world uh, joining us. Um, just to let you all know, we uh, George just let us in um, with that uh, Herbie Hancock, Chick Corea duet, I guess. It's, was it original? I did it as a singlet. As but... a singlet. But um, it was inspired by. Yeah. And um, I... Uh, uh, before we get into our jazz conversation, George, I, I have a few house cleaning items. So I'm going to uh, mute your microphone just for a bit and go through those and then come right back to you. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for joining us, people from around the globe who joined Artist Works for, uh, to talk jazz with George Witte. Uh, first, to learn more about George and his music, visit his online blog at www.gwitty.com. And George also maintains a YouTube channel, which has some truly great performance videos, including the Chick Corea or Herbie Hancock uh, collaborations that uh, uh, George um, just played a little bit of. Of course, uh, I have questions for George, but during the next hour, we want to take questions from our audience. We are going to do that using Twitter. So the idea is here is tweet your questions uh, to at ArtistWorks. And I will be monitoring, monitoring the Twitter feed during the Hangout and will do my best to weave in your questions uh, as we go along. So again, the uh, Twitter handle is at ArtistWorks. I'll see them on my screen in front of me and we'll pepper them into the, to the discussion as we can. Uh, now, just a few words about the George Whitty School of Jazz Piano at Artist Works. Uh, some people find this hard to believe, but this is a fact. For $25 per month or even less, at artistworks.com, you can take jazz piano lessons from George Whitty, and you will get feedback and personal instruction, not from someone who plays like George, but from George himself. And as a special offer to our live listeners, uh, here's a, a, a unique offer just for the people listening live right now, and it's good through the rest of this weekend. Use the promo code LIVE20 to receive 20% off any ArtistWorks subscription to Georgia School or any of the 30 other instrument schools at ArtistWorks. And people, I've also been asked to mention that music lessons make wonderful holiday gifts, if you didn't know that. And yes, the LIVE20 promo code can be used to save 20% on Artist Works holiday gifts. So that's Live 20, L I V E 20, for a 20% discount on any product from Artist Works. Okay, that's the end of the commercial, uh, dear listeners, and now on with the show. And I'm going to turn George's mic back on because that's who you want to hear from. Here we go. All right. And uh, George, thanks again for joining us. Totally my pleasure. Fantastic. Um, okay, so for the first question, I'm, I, I can get a little starstruck. Um, and you have played with some of the truly great jazz and popular music artists uh, of our times. David Sanborn, Celine Dion, Carlos Santana, and of course, the legendary Herbie Hancock. Uh, George, to start off our discussion, please tell us about your work with Herbie. How did you guys meet? And what is your personal experience of one of the greatest jazz pianists of all time? Well, you have to understand first that uh, Herbie has always been one of my couple, like, real idols. Um, you know, I grew up in a little town in Oregon, and uh, 
there was nobody there that knew anything about jazz, but we had a good record store in town. And I, that right when I started to get interested in jazz, that's when keyboard magazine came out. And that was sort of my portal into who was cool. Um, and I characterized the music of, of Herbie and weather report and chick Korea and Wayne shorter and these guys as sort of messages from my home planet to where I lived. It, it was like these, the, these people I felt like were speaking my languages or something, and, and there was nobody else from my home planet in Coos Bay. Uh, so, you know, I had been working with Michael Brecker for, gee, probably 16 or 18 years by the time I moved out to Los Angeles. And when I moved out here, Mike said, you know, that he would introduce me to Herbie. And I, of course, I said, you know, that's fantastic. And so, I hooked up with Herbie. I went to his house. Um, if I remember right, that was the first of our very late hangs. Herbie's a night owl. And when he's messing with technology, he likes to start, you know, at 10 p.m. and go all night. And uh, I got involved. I, I do a very sophisticated thing on the laptop with Logic, using it as a live instrument host. And I ended up designing Herbie's live rig, his computer stuff at least, um, and did that for a couple years. And you know, Herbie was on the road with it, and it was great, and I loved hanging out with him. And then one night, just kind of out of the blue, he says, uh, you know, I'd like to hear some of your music that's not jazz. And I said, well, you know, I got 60 or 70 film and TV cues on my web page. And so we put that up, and to my amazement and delight, Herbie spent about an hour and a half just listening to my stuff, you know, and I'm sitting there going, is this really happening? I mean, you know, this is Herbie Hancock. And at the end of that, he said uh, that he thought I would probably be the right person for this very ambitious gig that he had in mind. And he and Wayne Shorter had done these unbelievably great duet concerts about 10 years earlier. And they had had the idea of having these things orchestrated out so that they could play them with an orchestra. And that's how I got involved doing that. And I, I basically took the duo things, wrote a bunch of orchestration for them, took them in and played it for them, and they both said, great, keep going. And uh, we eventually copied one out and went and played it with three orchestras up in the Northeast, one of whom played it brilliantly, one of whom did you know, not quite as brilliantly, but that's kind of an ongoing project that I'm hoping to see if I can get it going with a couple European orchestras this summer. And then they needed some help with a record called uh, The Imagine Project. And they had all the basics done and they really just needed to, to flesh it out with some production and some colors and especially on a, a tune, a Peter Gabriel tune called Don't Give Up. Um, a bunch of orchestra underneath it. So I did some stu subtle stuff there and, you know, we've kind of been in touch since then. Phenomenal story. You know, you seem to have been um, in the right place at the right time in a lot of situations. And, um, uh, and uh, you certainly took advantage of your opportunity to, uh, to show Herbie your stuff. Uh, Tell me a little bit, maybe before we move on, you mentioned some of your composition work for videos. And, um, you know, how does that compare to composing for uh, a CD of your own or for somebody else's? Um, well, I, I, had I not done all the, the TV and film stuff that I've done, which at this point is probably some four or 500 cues for various TV shows and feature films and so forth, I wouldn't be an effective writer, I don't think, jazz-wise. Um, compositionally, I've, I've always, my ear has always in instantly gravitated to, you know, the great film composers, Ennio Morricone, uh, Thomas Newman, um, you know, these guys, it, it's a different head, it, it's a little bit more of a um, kind of coming from a classical place in terms that I think of it as a figured bass approach, maybe a little bit more than a, a chord-based approach. But from the minute I started working on TV, which was for uh, a soap opera, um, as the world turns, I was hooked on it. Um, 
I, I was a person that had a lot of writer's block before that. The blank slate, you know, I would spend six weeks working on 16 bars of music, uh, trying to get it to where it made you exuberant and yet weepy and, you know, covered all these different bases. And then I got that gig and uh, suddenly it's like you're just getting paid by the minute they play. And it becomes a much more kind of a crass equation where you can't spend three months on one cue getting it to be 100%. You spend three months on 20 cues getting them to 85%. But then what I found was that just by exercising that muscle over and over again, my 85% pretty soon became 100%. And I, I just got where I was a very efficient composer. Um, and all of that stuff, you know, I love jazz that's kind of cinematic to start with. Um, you know, Pat Metheny's music comes to mind immediately. A lot of the ECM music, Wayne Shorter's music, uh, very cinematic. And Herbie Hancock actually um, it does a lot of very cinematic stuff as well. And he actually played me something once, his tune, Actual Proof, which we all know is the funkiest thing that's ever been played in the jazz realm, was actually like a, a Latin, light Latin ballad film cue. And uh, I think they, they got this idea of, well, let's, let's play, put, the, put a beat on this, and Mike Clark started to play. So, you know, I, I think uh, in, in all of my writing, there's, there's something, some picture in my head, at least, that I'm trying to communicate. Fantastic. I, I just want to make a note to our viewers that um, many of George's uh, film and movie cues, as he calls them, are available to look at on his blog, which is can be uh, reached at www.gwitty.com. And um, for uh, again, for people who may have arrived late, we're talking with George Witty. And um, uh, George is a, is a great jazz musician in the largest sense. He's a composer, um, a technical guru in the, uh, in the control room. Um, he's been a studio musician and backed up some of the uh, great jazz and popular artists of our time. And he's been a touring performer quite successfully for more than 20 years. Um, so, and then last but not least, uh, George has spent um, more than 20 years giving back in the form of educating uh, people in in jazz music and his latest gig on that front is uh, leader of the jazz piano school at artist works um, again George thanks for being with us I want to now sort of switch gears a little bit and talk about touring experiences and um, and actually maybe before that that uh, Going into that, as we should recognize that in 2004, you won a Grammy Award uh, for your participation with Randy Brecker in his 34th and Lex album. And uh, your fingerprints, so to speak, are all over that album. You played the keyboards and um, you personally mixed and mastered the CD. Can you tell us about that experience and were you surprised to win that Grammy? Not really, because you know, we all knew that that was a really cool disc. And, uh, you know, Randy is one of the great characters ever and a very dear friend of mine. And he was actually the sort of the, the guy who gave me my lever into, you know, really the, the top echelon of the electric jazz business. Um, I was introduced to him by his ex-wife, Iliani Elias, who's an incredibly brilliant piano player. And I had done some live work with Iliani and done some stuff in there that, that she was kind of surprised by. She had a, uh, a little tune, I forget what it was called, but it was like a take six vocalese thing, like a little, a pop, um, a bop melody, really. It went like that, but it, all of that was harmonized in six part harmony. And she thought that we couldn't do that live. So I went and I had a, an eight track tape machine at home and I figured out the arrangement, sang all the parts onto it and cut each syllable up into a, you know, its own thing and arranged them on a chromatic scale so that if I played up the chromatic scale, I could play all the phrases on there. And she was delighted by that and we ended up being able to do the tune live. So when Randy asked her for somebody to be like, 
to help him produce the demos that he was writing for the first Return of the Brecker Brothers in 19, record in 1992, she recommended me. And Randy gets in touch with me out of the blue. I remember I was skiing in Killington at the time, and I get this call that I'm going to work on this project. And, you know, I was just ecstatic. And then Randy shows up, and he's got these funny little demos that he does in hotel rooms on, like, a Casio keyboard. Uh, but there, there's genius in there. And so I took all his information and, you know, made it sound, I'm a very good drum programmer and always have been, and made, it, made the whole thing sound like, you know, like a CD cut. And that's kind of how I got the gig with Randy. And by the time we got to 2003, when we were making 34th and Lex, we were a well-oiled machine. And he could send me stuff, and I, I kind of knew how he wanted it to be. But, you know, there were many funny instances. We made that record in my apartment in the middle of Manhattan. And, you know, we would, we would have it up, the tune up, and Randy would come over, and he'd be sitting there listening. And both Mike and Randy Brecker have what I call the, the Thelonious Monk gene. If everything's going too smoothly, they're not interested in it. Like, they're... Wow. It, it just doesn't pique their curiosity. So at different times, we would have the thing up, and Randy would decide that even with his writing, as sophisticated as it was, that it was too inside. And he would say, but take that clavinet part and just you know, start transposing it randomly around. Wonderful. And you know, so I would transpose it around, and finally, like, you know, I'd transpose it up a tritone, and Randy would be like, all right, you know, there. Hey, and, I've been I've been asked George to um, to encourage you to play something from that CD, and I know I'm putting you on the spot, but um, can you reach into your bag of tricks and maybe anything from the Brecker Brothers would be great. Oh boy, uh, I don't think I really even rem I can't play any of that okay. you know, on the piano. I, I honestly I hate to say it, but I don't remember that record well enough to remember how any of those tunes go. And also, Randy's harmony is so sophisticated that if you don't have a chart in front of you, you're not likely to play it right. So OK, let that be a lesson to my audience. Don't, um, don't call <laughs> any audibles in the middle of a hangout. because uh, <laughs> At least not with Randy's music. At least not with Randy's music, right? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I know I heard a little Vince Goraldi earlier. So <laughs> but um, let's, uh, let's, let's move on to uh, out of the studio and get into um, touring. Uh, and you know, it was 20 years on the road, some amazing gigs, some incredible music was created. Uh, but maybe this is just a personal interest of mine. I, I can imagine flights being missed, uh, instruments showing up at the wrong place, uh, people getting sick. Uh, tell us about, you know, a catastrophe <laughs> or, or something like that. Well, um, Everyone in the Brecker Brothers remembers this, this gig we did in Malta. And uh, it, it was just a succession of funny disasters. Um, you know, Mike came out and, and tripped over a monitor and went down like a ton of bricks. Um, at, at one point, he's playing, and this giant bug comes flying out of the port in the monitor. And, you know, he screams, and, and like everybody... <laughs> Everybody but Rodney Holmes, I think, was playing drums, had to stop playing. We were just laughing too hard. You know, this, the whole, it, we lost power. Um, you know, that one stands out as kind of a, a disaster. And then there, there have been a lot of other things that happened with that band. Um, talking about flights, I can remember we we had tons and tons of gear that was back in the days when there was money to send everybody's you know i myself had 800 pounds of stuff by the time it was all in cases and we'd put it in a container and carne it over to europe you know and it would take 10 days to get there and we took off from a an airport in sweden in in like a cessna and we had all that stuff in the back. And Mike's Iwi was a couple racks that weighed at least 200 pounds. And my rack weighed 120 pounds. And my weighted keyboard. And this is all in the back of this, you know, six-seater plane. 
And we went chugging down the runway in that thing, and we, are, we all really thought that we were not going to succeed in taking off by the end of the runway and that we were just going to crash. Oh, my God. And, you know, with 20 feet to spare, we kind of started to get off the ground. Um, and then there was that gig in uh, uh, Andorra. I think I told you about this one, where, you know, Andorra is a little kind of a city-state very, I think it's the tiniest country in the world or something like that, up there in the Alps somewhere. And we had a tour bus with all our stuff in it. It was a big, big old double-decker tour bus. And the road to get to Andorra was this little winding two-lane road. And the bus got to the bottom and they just said, there's no way we're going to get up there. And somehow um, we couldn't get anything else down there to get the gear in time. And we had to go on, and we didn't have our stuff. So we went to a music store, the one music store in Andorra, and everybody just kind of, you know, Mike Stern is sitting there. It's like, well, all right, I'll, I'll use this one amp out of the three you have. And Dennis Chambers, I think, was playing drums. And he's like, well, all right, I'll take these. And the only thing they had for me, all they had was consumer keyboards. And the one that I ended up with had Muppets on it. There so you go. I actually did a, a Brecker Brothers gig with one of the keyboards being like a Muppets Casio keyboard, you know, right. but the, the show must go on. Sure. And then it was probably mentioned in Keyboard Magazine and then all around the industry, Muppets start appearing on people's keyboards. <laughs> no, that fortunately, and I think that was before everybody had a cell phone. So I, I don't think there's a video of that. There is video, unfortunately, of one gig I did where uh, it, it was with the Brecker Brothers and it was Halloween night and it was in Germany. And uh, I, just as a goof, I blacked out all my teeth but one. And uh. I kept my mouth shut until we got on stage and everyone was asking me like, are you okay? Is something wrong? And I was like, well, everything's fine. <laughs> And then once I got on stage, I started smiling at people. But, you know, there's video of that. It was, was it in Frankfurt? Something, but, you, you know, I look unwell. There you <laughs> on YouTube. Okay, I am um, going to interrupt you here for a second and um, just give our uh, viewers a reminder that we're taking questions at, at ArtistWorks via Twitter. So a tweet to at ArtistWorks. We'll get into our queue and, and get your question in front of George, hopefully. Um, and actually, I have a question that has, has arrived. And um, you know that the, uh, this is from a classically trained pianist. Uh, can you please tell me how a classical trained pianist can start to take an improvisation solo for the first time? Uh, and um, and for that matter, George, how do you teach improvisation? Well, the, I was a classically trained guy. I took classical lessons for 10 years. And, you know, so by the time I came to jazz, I already, I had good keyboard feel. I had a good touch. Um, you know, I, I knew my way around the keyboard. Um, but when, when jazz was presented to me, it was presented in terms of the modes which are seven note scales. Um, that's, the, uh, that's the major scale, that's the Ionian mode. That's the Dorian mode. And in theory, all of those notes, if you're playing on a, on a C major chord, all the notes, all the notes in the, the uh, C major scale should work. The problem is that, that it really, it matters when you're creating your jazz lines, it matters what notes of the scale you're putting on the beat. Um, for example, that doesn't, that doesn't sound right. And, you know, it should work. It's, it's an F, it's in the C major scale. Um, and finally, you know, I, I had studied at Berkeley for a couple of years and, you know, I'd been working on my own for many years before somebody showed me the principle of the eight note scale. There's an additional note in there. And the idea with that is that if you play these scales, you keep the chord tones on the beat. So the notes that are on the beat are making this nice, 
consonant sonority. And the minute I got my head around that, all of a sudden, all the stuff that I had, because I had good shapes, I had good melodic instincts, but I would listen to myself playing and say, man, I was doing great, and then it wandered off the farm har harmonically. Okay. And so that is an essential thing. You just add that into your vocabulary, which is the very first thing we start out with on the Artist Works lessons. That's the, the F7 eight note scale. We call it a bop scale. So that's, that's a really critical thing. And if you're already rocking it on classical piano, you're going to sink right into this. And rather than trying to figure out why the modes aren't working for you, start right out with this principle of minding which notes you put on the beat. And if you transcribe like a great bebop solo, I like to say Sonny Stitt, Clifford Brown, uh, Bud Powell, you'll find these little passing tones that little additional note is all over in these things. And if you analyze them for which notes of the scale are on the beat, you'll find that it tends to be chord tones. Um, we did a little quick series of five, like three or four minute lessons, sort of just as introductions to artist works. And I found one of them online. I, I forget where I found it, unfortunately. But in those, I start people off with the idea of let's just learn a pentatonic scale. And that's a C, C minor pentatonic scale is C, E flat, F, G, B flat, and C. Yeah. And then what we do, we, we give people, there's a ton of play along tracks. There's actually more than 300 that are going to be available eventually on Artist Works. Put up the C blues track and just use those five notes. that stuff there was one I played a little G flat in there I did that yep. uh, but all the other notes are just that one little scale and if you can get that going now you get a chance to work on all the other aspects of playing jazz which is you know your time feel um, where you're putting things in space the the uh, the idea of phrasing in a jazz way I mean I encourage people to take that scale and play motivically on it and if you've got the little play-along track going, this is a hell of a lot of fun. You know, you've got a bass player and a world-class drummer who are chugging along underneath you and play motivically. And again, all that is is that C minor pentatonic scale. And from there, it's just a matter of expanding your vocabulary. And the, one of the very first tools that we, we talk about in artist works is a little thing called an approach pattern. It's those three notes, two notes from above and one from below. And all you do is you target one of the notes in your pentatonic scale. that is, the whole thing, is that one little tool, the approach pattern and the pentatonic scale. Um, you, you just know, opened I, my ears, George. I'm, I'm, what's that? You, know, you just opened my ears in terms of I've heard that kind of approach pattern. Oh yeah, it's, it's never, all over. I never knew it existed, what I was listening to, but immediately it says, okay, jazz riff coming, sort of. And exactly, yeah. and that's one of four of those approach patterns.
that's another one. Yeah. Um, and basically the idea, you know, we don't learn to ride a bicycle by reading about riding a bicycle. You have to be on it to, to like get a feel for the ballistics of it and, and kind of how, you know, I mean, it, to get to learn to balance on it. So the idea here is to get you on the bicycle and having fun, especially, that's the main thing, as quickly as possible with some tools that, you know, jazz musicians have been using since the 30s. So, you know, like I say, if you're already in shape with, with your classical side and you've got a good technique and a good touch, all you need is to, rather than fussing with, with the stuff that really no jazz musicians use, the modes are useful uh, in the context of, of sort of just seeing the harmony laid out on the keyboard. But if you analyze the solos of the masters, they're actually using these eight note scales instead. Freddie Hubbard, great trumpet player, classic. I mean, when I started studying with Jerry Berganzi in Boston, that was one of the first things he had me do was transcribe some Freddie Hubbard solos because he knew that I was a huge Freddie Hubbard fan. And boy, when you analyze what's on the beat there, it's meticulously chord tones or chord tones of things that he's substituting onto the harmony. Um, and that, that for me was the great epiphany. That's fantastic. Um, yeah. and, and that's the kind of instruction you will get at artistworks.com. And again, you, uh, George will ask you to uh, submit videos of your playing, and you will get George's video response directly back, and not from a student of his, from George. And we'll talk a little bit about video exchange uh, later in this broadcast. Uh, but before we do, uh, George, uh, I'd like to give you a chance to play for us again one of the pieces that you've pre prepared. OK. Um... I think I'll play uh, a piece by Kenny Wheeler, who's another great trumpet player, sort of a, an ECM. If you know, that's a label up, uh, in Germany that's put, put out a lot of really different jazz over the years. And it's from a, a record called Hey Oak or Hey OK. I never did figure out how to pronounce that, even though I've listened to it 2,000 times. And I think that's what the name of this tune is. And it's just a really beautiful tune with harmony that, that doesn't come from the, the standard uh, idea of, you know, cadences of 2-5-1 and the usual jazz thing. It's, it's much more liberally interpreted, but it, it's beautiful. It's a little bit challenging to play on. But I've always loved this tune. So let me unplug the talk mic.
That was special, George. Thank you so much for that. And, and um, thanks very much to my iPhone for <laughs> its input there. I thought, yeah, it was your fans calling. I, I was sure. I was I, sure of I've that. Been ringing off the hook. They just they pester me. They're I see them outside my front door even as we uh, speak. Terrible. Yes. Well, they had. I know they had to um, to hunt for you carefully because you're not exactly on a street corner in downtown Los Angeles right now. But, <laughs> That's uh, right. We won't reveal your exact location. I um, uh, we have a number of great questions that have come in um, on the Twitter uh, the Twitter line. Uh, and again, to get a question to George, it's uh, at ArtistWorks uh, is where you want to send your tweet. Uh, I've been asked also to uh, remind everybody of our live twenty promotion code. So if you want to learn jazz with George, or uh, we have. Nathan East in bass guitar. We've got uh, 30 uh, outstanding uh, instructors at artistworks.com, and you can learn from anyone, any one of them with the code LIVE20 for a 20% discount uh, now through the end of the weekend. And of course, the LIVE20 code will work uh, with our gift certificates. So if you know a musician and you'd like to give them uh, the best music instruction available in the world, um, Go to live, go to artistworks.com, use the promo code LIVE20, and save a little money doing it. All right, I'm going to turn to our, um, our Twitter feed here. Um, here's a uh, comment in from uh, Gerardo Avilia Kishena, and sorry if I mangled your name, Gerardo. Hi, George. First, thank you very, very much for your lessons. I am learning a lot. Um, I'm just going to uh, add another comment here and a question from IMGN, and I've put you on the spot before, George, so I'm a little nervous about this, but just want to let you know what your fans are asking for. Hey, George, can we hear on a clear day, smiley face? So he's uh, a fan of that. Now, I here's a, um, a question uh, that I have from Joel Aldridge. Um, he says, uh, what makes a jazz standard a jazz standard? Um, you know, when, when, when you get on the stage with other jazz musicians, uh, do you all have sort of a repertoire that you all agree on as the standard repertoire? Uh, you know, traditionally a standard has meant something that was usually a Broadway show tune um, that got co-opted by jazz musicians and, you know, and back in the 40s, you know, they started out playing it as, as the standard, uh, you know, Embraceable You or whatever it would be. And then they, you know, Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie and, and these guys started pinching the chords from the standard and writing their own head on it. And I think that part of the theory there was that you can't copyright the chords to a tune, but you can copyright the melody. But a standard is basically, you know, and they, they don't write them like this anymore. Uh, I can think of some great writers, but it was a tune with really great harmony to blow on. And, uh, you know, On a Clear Day is a really a perfect example of that. And I can't recommend this record enough. There's a, a Red Garland record called Feelin' Red that has Red on piano and my favorite rhythm section, uh, Sam Jones on bass and Al Foster on drums. And boy, do they swing that thing. I heard that on the radio in my hometown when I was a, a kid. And uh, I was the seventh caller, and I won it. I was yeah. probably also callers one through six, because I don't think anyone else was listening to the little jazz show on there. <laughs>
really pretty chords in there um, that work in a way that's very compatible with with jazz, you know. Um, so, and that, you know, of course, it, what is that from? Uh, it's from a great musical. And that's, you know, an instant standard. Uh, you know, Miles Davis popularized so many standards. But the truth is that there's al also a lot of stuff now, a lot of, you know, Wayne Shorter's writing, uh, Herbie Hancock's writing, uh, some of John Coltrane's stuff is now effectively a standard because if you get to a jam session, it's that stuff is going to get called too. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the my personal in, uh, interests is uh, the relationship between rhythm and jazz, and and then uh, modifications to the melody or changing up the melody. And um, you recommend a number of things uh, on YouTube and beautiful sort of renditions of different classic melodies. Um, one day my prince will come. I think there's a Chick Corea and Herbie Hancock version of that. That's just astonishing. I was listening to it all last night. Um, is there a particular way of of playing with a melody, of of jazzifying it, that 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 you teach, or is it is it just inspiration in the moment? Well, for one thing, if we're people, when I do clinics and workshops around the world, a, a common question is how, how do I get my own sound going? And one of the things that I recommend there is that people take either the melody of one of these standards or take a solo that they really like, pinch a little figure out of it, a little motif, and then do like a theme and variations thing on it. Because if your ear is attracted to it in the first place, then, it, you know, it's kind of, it's, in your DNA to start with, and then anything you do that's that's like a variation on that is your own, that's your head at work. So you're, you're taking the inspiration from whatever it is that, that you got, you know, a little phrase off of a solo or the melody of one of these tunes, and you're expanding on that in, in a way that's unique to you. And, you know, jazz started out really a lot of what they did was, you know, Johnny Hodges would take the melody of, of a Duke Ellington tune and start with that and then embellish that. And so the two are kind of one and the same. I mean, if, if we're playing... That's Stella by Starlight. And take any of the little phrases out of there... Um, and then um, you just take that fragment and the way that you develop it, it might be easier to do it on something with simpler changes. Um, you know, let's just do some one five or two five one. common element is, is da, 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 like that that rhythm is the common element that I'm keeping that makes it a motivic thing but the notes that I'm coming up with are are my own voice coming out so if the way that it used to be uh, you know back to Stella by Starlight <laughs> This kind of thing where they were just you could hear still hear the melody underneath it but it was it was being you know enhanced and kind of ornamented by the player um, as an interesting aside if, if you listen to Elvin Jones playing on anything you hear this constant grinding as he's playing it sounds like this and I, I found out from somebody 
that that's actually it's Elvin singing the melody, and you know Elvin Jones has a a, a range of about a minor second, so he can't actually sing the melody. But that's how melodic a drummer he was. It's like he never forgot that the tune was the tune, and I, I don't know if it had anything to do with keeping him, you know, in sync with with where he was at in the tune, but I suspected it was more of a thing that he was always playing the song no matter where the band went. So, hopefully that answered the question. Okay, my mic just came back on. I had muted myself. Uh, that's phenomenal. What a great story. And I think it did. I think it did. And and if, if you know, it, it find a piece of the melody that touches you in the heart and then you know, work with that snippet and embellish it. That's what yeah. I sort of that, that's what I heard. And with with, with a huge amount of uh, of practice and expertise and creativity on top of that. Um, I uh, George, you asked me if if um, if there are times uh, your your sound goes down a little bit. It's probably because you're not wearing your mic. So I think that was for a little bit of that. But I think our sound was pretty darn good. Um, we 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 got. We got the piano really well, and, and we heard what you were uh, explaining. Um, I would, um, I think, maybe uh, again, and and I just want to uh, thank you for um, just jumping into on a clear day. Uh, that was not part of the script, people. That was a request off of Twitter. And I barely Christmas remembered time. it, but you know, that's <laughs> one that you just you play it by ear, so. Well, it was wonderful, and uh, we've 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 got it captured uh, for for posterity. Um, George, I, we've only got a few minutes left, and and um, um, I'm going to ask you to sort of play us out. But before we do that, um, you know, this idea, uh, and and you're a, you're a technologist. Um, the idea that you can teach jazz piano uh, online is a pretty amazing thing, and. Um, uh, tell us about how you provide personal instruction to your students at artistworks.com. I'd like people to know about that. Well, the idea with, with Artistworks is that there's a, a giant repository of lessons that take you logically from basically the very beginning to playing pretty sophisticated stuff. Um, and these you can watch at your own pace, on your own timeline, and one of the cool things about it is that you can watch them again and again. And they're all supplemented by, you know, me talking, by PDF download things, uh, by the play-along tracks and so forth. And so a lot of students have already, you know, gotten to me with their first video exchange. And with some of these, I've done several now. and. It's like you get you 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 take take the lesson online. They're typically about eight or ten minutes long. You get it under your fingers, and when you feel like you've got something that that you want to get some feedback on, just take something with your your cell phone or whatever. Just the simplest video sound doesn't have to be good. Nothing. Send it to me, and I will have a look and a listen, and get back to you with you know personal feedback, just as if I were sitting next to you. And I'm a real gas bag with these things. I have trouble keeping them under eight minutes. But you know, I comment on everything that I see from from you know your posture. You know, are you playing relaxed? How's your time? Does your technique look efficient? Are you fingering things well, and so forth? And you know, work to get you through that lesson with an A, so that when you hit the next one, you're building on a solid foundation from the previous lesson. And um, I really, I'm just enjoying the hell out of these things. I've got everything on the video exchanges from, you know, a, a young girl who looks like she might be 10 to, uh, you know, 60 year olds in Scotland and so forth. And uh, it's it's fascinating to me. And it's, it's really great to be able to actually kind of put your hands with whoever it is that's learning this stuff and, uh, make sure that as they go, everything is is you know in alignment for them to make it all the way as far as they want to go. And without the video exchanges, I don't think that would be possible. You know, how would I know what you're doing? Um, you know, yeah, yeah. So it, it's it's one of the strongest features 
of the lessons for sure. Well, I'm, I'm delighted uh, to have you say that. And, and George has, has an incredible uh, history as an educator, as well as as a performance musician, and as well as as a music producer and composer. He's, he's done personal lessons. He's done master classes. He has his own set of CDs. And, uh, uh, and now he's with artistworks.com. So, George, thank you for a wonderful hour. Um, we learned a lot um, about uh, both how to play jazz and the experience of being a jazz musician. Um, we'll do it again sometime. Uh, but um, uh, on the way out, um, we'd love to hear you play one more time. Do you have anything for us? Well, I, you mentioned earlier, uh, Someday My Prince Will Come. Yeah. And that's another tune that just has changes that are really a gas to blow on. They, they kind of propel you forward in a way that I enjoy. And it's also another thing that's on that Chicken Herbie record. So I think I'll play that on the way out. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, we'll see you again soon. Great. Thanks. The great George Witte, and thank you so much, George, for joining us here at Artist Works. Um, My and um, before we go, I just wanted to, uh, you know, thank thank people from around the world for attending our hangout. Uh, we'll make this available on our YouTube channel, of course, and we've had people from five different countries. Um, from including the United States and a wonderful lot of wonderful comments. Just call out a few names. Kevin Riley was here. Linda Matthews was here. Uh, Gerardo Avila Cachena was here. IMGN, uh, Joel Aldridge, and um, thank you all. This is Joe McDonough saying goodbye for Artist Works.